All right, so I want to jump right in here. I love Psalm 23. It's, um, it's a psalm we're all very familiar with. We go to it when we need to be comforted, when uh, things are feeling overwhelming, when we feel like we're literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death, yet we still fear no evil. So I just want to jump right in here. Um, point number one is I hope that I'm secure enough. I hope that I'm secure enough. We all think about this. We, uh, depending on where you live, uh, you might lock your doors at night. You might lock them with several things at night. I remember when I first moved to San Antonio, I was like, lock it, lock the deadbolt. And I'm like, I feel like I need about three more locks here. This isn't quite enough at home. Like, you know, you just, when, when you're not comfortable, when you're out of your element, security becomes important. And um, if without security, you can't be at rest. Without security, you can't sleep. Without security, you can't function. Without security, you can't do what you've been called to do because you're too worried about um, if, you're at, if you're being threatened or not. I think, of, I think of the builders coming back from exile, going back to Jerusalem or going back to their city and rebuilding a wall. They couldn't rebuild it because they're constantly under attack. They had to have people on rotation that were defending so they could be secure enough to do the task that was set before them. So security is just fundamental. Going into psychology, uh, if you talk about the hierarchy of needs, we need air, we need water, we need food, and then we need security. Like that is right after our basic needs. We, we absolutely need to feel secure. So how do we feel secure? Read God's word. If, you're, if you don't feel secure, if you're not at peace, if you're uncomfortable, if you're out of your element, if you're struggling with things, get in God's word. Get in God's word. Glean from God's word. Absolutely. God's word will bring you through. It'll bring you life. It'll bring you hope. It'll bring you peace. It'll bring you security. And I love the passage of Psalm 23. So let's just take a look quick at Psalm 23. It just says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We could just put a period right there. We could be done with it. If the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want, that means we don't need anything. I'm not lacking anything. I don't have anything left. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have any other needs. I don't need anything. The Lord's my shepherd. I, all my needs are met. We could just, we could be done right there. But what people like to do, they, they sometimes say, Hey, I'm a Christian. I serve the most powerful God, the creator of heaven and earth, an all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipotent, perfect, eternal God. And because I serve him, I don't have all I need. I'm not at peace right now. I can't get through this. I, I'm still struggling for things. It's like, wait a minute. No, no, no. Let's get that. Let's, let's look at this again. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. And therefore, all your needs are met. Therefore, you have no wants. Therefore, you don't need anything else. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He gives us rest. He, sometimes when I was a kid, I needed to like, my dad would make me lie down. I'd get up, put your head back down on the pillow, head back down on the pillow, lay down. Sometimes we don't have the sense to be at rest ourselves and God gives us that rest that we need. I love, I've um, <clears throat> done messages on this whole psalm before and you could break this apart and speak an entire message on Psalm 23. I love it, but... Um, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I hope I am secure enough. The Lord is my shepherd, and therefore I shall not want. He is my shepherd, therefore I am at rest. Therefore I have nothing to fear. Therefore I am fearless because the Lord is my shepherd. If God is for us, who can be against us? And sometimes we, 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 don't, we, we don't have a proper perspective. Uh, when, when we say magnify the Lord, what that means, 
picture taking like a magnifying glass and magnify something, we have to look at God and put our focus on him. Then all of a sudden, the thing that we magnify is bigger than everything else. God's already bigger than everything else. But we like to look around and look at our problems and, oh, look at this issue. I got, you know, I got, got a little cut right here on my wrist. And, oh, let me look. Oh, this is a big deal. Look how big this is. I can't get through this. God's my shepherd. I shall not want. But I got this poor little cut on my wrist. I can't do anything. I'm just, I'm just so weak. I'm, 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 there, there's no hope. It's over. What are we going to do? And that's not what God's calling us to do. God's calling us to be bold, hopeful, strong Christians that are empowered by his word that know how to search the scriptures, that know how to glean life out of the scriptures, and know how to give that to other people. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore we have no other needs. We have nothing to fear. Whom shall I be afraid if the Lord is on my side? Who, who can be against us if the Lord is on our side? It doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter what the news says. It doesn't matter what people in the government say. I serve a God that's bigger than that. My God is bigger than that. I remember uh, when I lived in Texas and worked with Matt Bell, we went to a preaching seminar. I think the best thing I got out of the whole thing is at the end they said, do you want to be a big God preacher or a little God preacher? And we both came out of that saying, I want to be a good God, big God preacher. If at the end of my message people think God's some weak, powerless entity that doesn't exist, I haven't done my job as a preacher. I want to be a preacher that magnifies God, that glorifies him, that projects him as something bigger than we think he is when you come into this service. Because my God is big enough to supply all my needs. My God is big enough to supply all my wants. My God is bigger than anything that I could be afraid of. My God is bigger than anything else. And if he's my shepherd, then who shall we be afraid of? Who shall we, what shall we lack? What shall we want? What are we missing? What else, what else is there? Nothing, absolutely nothing, if he is really our shepherd. So uh, point number one, and just, I can't, I could go over this more, but um, uh, we'll come back to it later, because Psalm 23 is just so good. But moving on, uh, point number two, I hope that I am strong enough. I hope that I am strong enough. I love Lamentation chapter 3, verse 18, it says, And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Notice that strength and hope are tied together here. If you're, picture a hopeless person. I can't do it. There's not enough. They're, they don't have the strength to make it through. That's a weak person. I was listening to um, an interview of this MMA fighter, and he's saying, you know, how do you, how do you last this long? And like, how do you make it to those, you know, late rounds, seven, eighth, and ninth round? How do you still keep your energy? He's like, I know you do a lot of endurance training, but like, how much is it? You know, is it mental? Is it physical? And he said, it's 80% mental, and it's 20% physical. I do a lot of training physically, but he said, it's really mental. I have to believe I can outlast this guy. I have to believe I'm stronger than this guy. I have to believe I can go one more round than he can. I convince myself that I'm stronger than he is, that I'm, that I'm bigger than he is. I can last longer than he is. He can't beat me, and I'm going to win in the end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outlast him. doesn't matter how hard he hits me. doesn't matter if I get knocked down. I'm going to get back up, and I'm going to beat that guy that I'm going against. And I was like, wow, I, we, need some, we need some spiritual battles like that. We need some spiritual warriors in the church like that so, that say, you know what? doesn't matter if I get knocked down a bit. I know who wins in the end. I have hope. I can read the scriptures. I know who's going to win, and nothing's going to keep me down. Nothing's going to hold me back. I serve a God that's bigger. He is in me, and greater is he who's in me. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid of? Because I'm not strong enough on my own, but God is. And God's on my side, and I'm fighting with him, and he's fighting with me, and I, there's nothing that we cannot take down together, because we will win in the end. God and me is a majority every single time because we will win in the end. Uh, so look at this, this verse where it ties strength and hope together. And then it says, um, a couple verses down, it says, Then I recall to mind all the things of God, and therefore I have hope. My hope and my strength left me. All these things are going, around, going on around me. I've lost it. I can't keep up. And my hope, my strength are gone. I'm sapped. I'm, I'm at the end. I'm tapped out. And then I think, and then I recall to mind all the things that God is, who God is, and what he's done. Then some hope comes back in my life. Then I have hope again. Then, if I have hope, I know that God, his mercies never fail me, that he is always faithful. And great is the faithfulness of God. Who can we be afraid? I'm strong enough with God, simply because once I have my hope back, 
I have strength again. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about hope here uh, this morning. Maybe, if I can get through this one. Duplicate, don't mind that one. All right, number three, I hope that I can hope enough. What is hope? We talk about hope a lot. We use the word hope a lot. But a lot of times when we use the word hope, we really don't really have it any different than wishful thinking. What's the difference in hope and wishful thinking? Let's take a look. If we hope, what is hope? Hope is the constant, unwavering, serene expectation of good. Notice there's a serenity in there. There's peace in there. Where hope is, there's peace. Where hope is, there is strength. Where hope is, there is life. And we need some hope in the church this morning. We need some hope in this nation this morning. We need some hope in our lives this morning. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If you've given up hope, you've given up. But if you have hope, there's a way. There's a possibility. There's truth. There's a future. There's something else coming. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Because I have hope. And that hope isn't just wishful thinking. Oh, I hope I win the lottery. I hope there's nice weather tomorrow. I hope, you know, this. And a lot of times we use the word hope. But true biblical hope is based on something more than just a wishful thought. So we have to have our hope in something because I can hope all I want in nothing. I can hope in myself. I can hope that the weather will be good. I can hope in this or that. But it is no better than wishful thinking because my hope isn't rooted in anything. My hope isn't grounded on anything. My hope isn't based in anything that gives me an assurance that what I'm hoping for will actually come true. And if you have no assurance, then you're just wishing. Then you're just, you're just hoping. It doesn't matter. But hope is something different than that. So what is this good? If we're, if we're hoping for good and have this expectation of good, some people that are always hopeful and always expecting good are called optimists. There's no room for Christians to be anything other than an optimist, according to Scripture. We should be Christian optimists. But what is that good we're looking for? That good is the promises that are found in God's Word. It's the strength and assurance based on who God is, who his, what his character is, his faithfulness, his strength, that his promises are going to come true. Does God put promises in his word? Absolutely. Do I have hope that those promises will come true? Yes, I do. Are those based on something that's absolutely true and founded and fundamentally right? Yes, they are. I can hope in anything else I want. Doesn't matter. But when I put my hope in the truths that are in God's word, that hope is founded on something greater than me, and that hope will always come true. And where there's hope, there's life. Where there's hope, there's strength. Where there's hope, there's endurance. Where there's hope, there's tenacity. Because, you know what? It doesn't matter how things look. I'm still going to win. It doesn't matter how things look. I, I can win in the end. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Because I have hope in something bigger than every circumstance. Bigger than everything I see. Bigger than everything I can look around. Or, you know, it doesn't matter what gets in my face. How loud it is. How ugly it is. It does not matter. Because I have hope in a God that's bigger than this situation. Bigger than me. And bigger than my enemies. And bigger than the devil under my feet. Because I have hope in something greater than myself. And that's what hope is. That's what true biblical hope is is. Where does hope come from? Does hope just spontaneously arrive? Is it something I can go get? Is it something I can cultivate? Where does our hope come from? 1 Peter 1.3 says, Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope is the direct result of being born again, being saved, having a new spirit within you, and all of a sudden we have a hope, and that hope used to be founded on a Savior's coming someday. There'll be a deliverer. There'll be a Messiah. For years and years, they hoped and hoped and hoped. It wasn't wishful thinking. It came true because they hoped on something that was promised in God's word, and that came true. Now on this side of the cross, we hope for the, re- for the second coming. We hope that Christ will come back and rule and reign on this earth again. We hope for that next thing. So true biblical hope always points to the future and always points to a future where God is on the throne, where he is coming back, where we put our hope not in ourselves, not in who- who's in office, not in any person, but we put our hope in God who has promised in his word what's going to happen and that's what we hope for. But hope comes from directly from being saved. Once we're saved, we have hope. Thessalonians talk about those who die, those who, those who perish. They don't die like those without no hope. Look in the world. It's not hard to see the hopelessness in people's eyes, hopelessness in people walking around. If you don't have Christ, if you don't have an eternity, if you don't have a future, 
and you look at these circumstances, what hope is there? Why would you hope for anything better? Why would you expect things to get better? We're really good at our natural minds looking at things and being like, well, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, then it's going to die. Like, that's, that's pretty much how our minds work. If you're a mother, I have a very good mother, an overly protective mother. I call her overmotherly sometimes. So when I'm out hiking, no, I'm dead in the woods somewhere. I'm not hiking and having a good time. <laughs> when I'm driving, I'm dead in a ditch. I'm hitting a deer. I'm not driving safe, listening to tunes, having a good time. Like, our natural mind, like, oh, this is going to happen. Like, this is bad. Like, that's how our brains work. And that's what people would be without hope. Where would we be without hope? What would our lives be without hope? What would be the point of getting through the day without hope? If you don't have a hope of something tomorrow, what are you doing today? It's lifeless. It's dead. You look around, there's people that are dead men walking around hopeless and don't have any idea who they are, what they're doing, what their purpose is, what tomorrow is going to bring. They're taking things as they come and there's zero life in it. I want no part of that. I pity people like that. I hope that I have enough God in me that they'll be able to see it and I can share that with them because people need hope right now. People absolutely need hope right now. I hope that I can hope enough. Second Second Thessalonians 2.16 says, Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish every good word and work. Sorry. Um, So he has loved us, and by his everlasting consolation, the good hope by grace has been given to us. Hope is a gift. Hope comes from the love that God has for us, the grace he's already been given us. The same grace that has saved us is the same grace that God gives us hope by. And that same act of salvation that we have flips a switch inside of us that all of a sudden we have this hope that's different. All of a sudden our hope isn't just for that next meal, but it's for eternity. Our hope goes beyond this life. How long is this life? This life is just a vapor in the wind. It's a few years, maybe a few decades. That's our life. Something much more than that. We have on this time because our is in something greater than ourselves. God's love. The source of hope is in God's love. Let me switch mics here. Amen. Now we should be familiar with this one. 1 Corinthians uh, 13. It's called the love chapter in the Bible. But look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, Now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I've heard a lot of messages on love. I've heard a lot of messages on faith. You don't hear a whole lot of messages on hope, and I hope that I can accurately... Am I good now? Switching back. Maybe. Nope, turned it off. There we go. Now we're on. There we go. All right, so... First Corinthians, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, but we're talking about hope and hoping this works out. And might switch back to the handheld... But faith, hope, and love are all important. This verse says they're all eternal. And they're all interdependent and and distinctly different. So if we have faith, hope, and love, what are the differences between these? And and, Because sometimes we say, you know, I have faith that this is going to happen, or I'm hoping that this is going to happen. We kind of use those words interchangeably sometimes, but what's the difference between those? So they are all different, and 1 Corinthians says they all remain. They're all enduring. They're all from the beginning, and they're all eternal. They're everlasting. Faith, hope, and love. Let's take a look at it. So faith, sorry, hope is based on true faith. What is faith? What is faith? We know from Hebrews 11, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. 
in the Greek is the underlying foundation of things that we hope for. People say, how can you be like that? You don't have any evidence. Faith is my evidence. I have faith, and therefore that is evidence. That is the substance of things that we hope for, that we believe in, that we look to, and that's the thing that is, has to be rooted and grounded on something bigger. So hope is based on true faith. faith. Faith is important. Love is important. Love is the greatest. We need all three. But these are all dependent. The love of God is what gives us hope. God gives us the grace to be able to have faith in him. And we base our, our, our faith is based on hope. It's getting confusing, I know. But faith is a substance and the evidence of things hoped for. And those things are based on the truth of God's word. Hope is in the mind. Faith is in the heart. Faith is in our spirit. When we truly believe in something to our fundamental being that we believe God says he is who he says he is, we believe God's word. We can believe that in our heart. But hope is in our mind. Hope is in our mind. Hope is the way we think. Hope is our outlook, our attitude, our, our optimistic joyfulness that we see situations and we see that it can get better, not that it's going to decay and get worse. Everything in this life naturally has a bend toward decay. Naturally, it will get worse. But we as Christians say, you know what? It would, but we believe in God. God makes things better. God gives life where there's death. God gives healing where there's brokenness. God brings order where there's chaos. God brings things and makes things better than they were. So we have a hope and an optimism that non-believers don't have. So there is no room for Christian pessimists because as Christians, we believe in a God that has second chances, that has redemption, that makes things better, that brings healing, that brings strength, that brings growth, that brings potential to the callings that he's already put in our lives. But hope is a mindset, and it's something that we put on in our mind. Hope is based in the future. We have faith today. And that, that gives us a mindset and a hope for what that will mean down the road. We have faith right now in God, and we have that faith right now, and that's real. And that faith is based on the truth of God's word, and therefore, we can hope. Because we have that faith, then we can put on that mindset, and then we can believe what's going to happen in the future. And that those things will be good. Now remember, a hope is a confident expectation of good, and that good is what God has promised by His strength, in His word, by His power. Hope is strengthened by testing. Remember in James, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Hope is strengthened through trials and tribulations. We're going to have trials and tribulations in this life. We are. And remember the parable of the two houses one was built on the rock, one was built on the sand. They can both put all the hope they want in their foundation, but unless their hope is based on something solid, unless their hope is based on something eternal, outside of the shifting sands of feeling and culture and everything else, unless that hope is based on something, they can hope all they want and it won't mean anything. And that's why faith and hope are tied together. We have to have our faith tied to our hope and our hope tied to our faith, and our faith tied to love of God, and God's love tied back to us. But if these things are off and not f fixed on the right thing, it won't make a difference. You can have all your faith that you want in Muhammad, B Buddha, or any other God. You can, you can have so much faith you're willing to die and blow yourself up based on your faith. But is that faith going to save you? Unless it's based on reality, unless it's based on truth, unless it's based on God's word, where ultimate source of truth comes from? doesn't matter. I can have all the faith I want in a little set of butterfly wings that's going to lift me to the moon, but it's not going to do it because it's not based on anything bigger than myself, anything true. It's not going to work. It's not true. So it's not simply believing, not simply hoping, not simply having faith in something. It's having faith and having belief and having hope into something bigger than ourselves that's true, and it's true because it's in God's Word. So hope is also strengthened through Testing. Hope produces steadfastness, endurance, and perseverance. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me again to Romans chapter 5, as in our reading here this morning. But I love this passage from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read it here. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope 
of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. What now? We glory in tribulations. We praise and exalt and we're happy in tribulations. That doesn't make sense. You're not supposed to be happy in tribulations. That's not how that works. But it says we glory in tribulations. Why? Because we know that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance produces godly character. And godly character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I've heard pastors say the Holy Spirit is just something, you know, that's an add-on. You get saved, you want to make sure you're going to heaven. If you, if you dabble in the Holy Spirit, good. If not, it doesn't really matter. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is absolutely essential. When you get saved, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it gives you fruit. It says, where is hope in the fruit of the Spirit? It's not there, but it is there in the armor. It, it is there. We'll get there in a little bit. Hope is absolutely essential. But if you're... Fruit changes. Think of the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, all those things, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, all these things are should be in the life of a Spirit-filled Christian, somebody that believes in the Word of God and is being filled and feeding on the Word of God so that in their daily lives they can exhibit these things that are an evidence and a witness to the people around us because all of a sudden when the whole world is going in a direction or a place we don't want it to go and stuff's hitting the fan and we have a good attitude and we're happy and we're doing good, we're secure, we're sound, we're still doing what God has called us to be and people are losing their minds next to us. They're saying, how is he okay? How is she okay? How is she still happy? How is she able to do that? What does she have that I don't have? What has he got that I don't have? I want some of that. I want some of that old Carmen song. Man, that's old. All right, but um, we have to have hope and faith in something that's grounded, something that's true, something that's bigger than ourselves. And we see this progression in Romans chapter 5, where first it produces perseverance, which produces character, produces godly character. That godly character is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the love, the joy, the peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. You can usually tell who Christians are by how they act. If you can't tell that you're a Christian by how you act, you might not be acting like a Christian. You might not be feeding on God's word. You might not be exercising your faith. You might not be working that out, working your salvation out. And finally, proven character and hope. Hope leads to perseverance, and it's absolutely essential. So when we have, when we have times of tribulation, when we have times of difficulty, when we're... When we're beaten down, we're tapped out, we don't have any more gas in the tank, we're tired out, we're fed up, we're at, we're at the end of our rope. I talked to a guy this week, he is going through some tough times. He's at the end, he's, he's got a short fuse, he's, he's going through it. But he has hope. He has hope it's going to get better. He says, this is the time, this is going to pass, God's going to get me through this. I said, amen, I prayed with him, believed with him, but if you say, this is it, can't handle anymore, I'm done, this is hopeless, this is useless, you're giving up, you're done. That's not what God calls us to be. He calls us to have hope. Hope in something better. Hope in something greater. Hope in a better days. And it's not just wishful thinking. It's, it's absolutely based on the promise of God's word. So you, you can say the same sentence. I can say, I hope tomorrow will be better than today. And I can also say, I hope tomorrow can be better than today. One is wishful thinking, but one is based on God's word and says, no, I know who God is. I know who his character is. I've been on my knees in prayer. I've done my business with God. I have a revelation and I know that he's going to come through for me. So I hope tomorrow will be better than today. And I'm basing off that off the truth of who God is, not wishful thinking. Not just, not just putting, writing down and putting it in a wish jar and hoping it comes true and crossing my fingers. That's not what hope is. Hope is based on something absolutely true that is the, God, the word of God that is bigger than us and bigger than anything we can be without him. We have to have hope. And hope finally produces godly character. All right, we got the three F's. Fact. Faith and feeling. Fact, faith, and feeling. Get these in the right order. Get these in the right order. This is important. Listen to this. So we have fact. Where does fact come from? Fact is truth. 
if you can have one set of facts and somebody else has another set of facts, one is true, one is not true. It doesn't matter what people say, one is ultimately true and what is not true. There is ultimate truth, truth is not relative, it does not change, one is true, one is false. Truth ultimately comes from God's word and the truth in God's word never changes. God says, I am the Lord your God and I never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is a God of truth. God is a God of consistency. God is a God of faithfulness. And when we base things in fact, in God's word, we can put our faith in that fact. So first we have fact. First we have truth. Then we put our faith in that fact. Then we believe to our fundamental core and our heart of hearts that what God's word says is true. What his promises say, he means and he will follow through with. He will come through. And when we believe the promises and we believe what God's word says, that can change our feeling. And our feeling is manifested in the hope and our outlook and our optimism that something will get better. That this will improve. That God will come through. And I'm hoping. I'm not just hoping, but I'm hoping that God's going to come through. And if you get these mixed up, if you, try to base, if you try to switch these around and say, I'm basing my faith on feeling, that's the guy that built this house on the sand. He's saying, I put all my faith into this sand, but sand shifts just like feeling does. It doesn't matter what you feel today. You might feel something different tomorrow. It doesn't matter. But we as Christians aren't called to be that way. We're called every single day to get in our word and read the same truth, the same Bible, the same way it's always been for hundreds of years. And that means we believe the same truths and the same promises. And then we can change our outlook to be the same. And that outlook is always going to be a good one because we've been fed by God's word. We're not going to beat down, be beat down by the world, be beat down by the news, be beat down by what anyone says, by what we're going through, by anything else. We are going to be optimistic and hopeful because the God of God's God of the Bible has promised in his word that he's going to come through, that he's bigger, that we win in the end. And when we put our hope and believe that, we can't help but that changing our feeling, changing the atmosphere around us, changing who we are, changing what we look to and what we hope for. And that is, that is fundamentally important. And it also goes back to spiritual warfare. We're in a spiritual battle. You can read in Ephesians, it says, take up the whole armor of God. When hope is, is given from, from regeneration, from birth, we have a new hope in salvation. It says, take up the armor of God. The armor of God is sitting there. We're baby Christians. We're born again. We can choose to pick that up and use it, or we can choose to leave it on the shelf. We do not inherently have the armor of God equipped, and we're not just able to use it like that. We have to learn how to use it. We have to equip it. We have to equip faith. We have to equip salvation. And if you, you say, where is hope in the armor of God? We have it Ephesians, but we also have um, somewhere, uh, I think it's Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Nope. Anyway, somewhere in Thessalonians it says, I can't find all my notes here. The, it refers to the armor again. It says, it refers to the breastplate of righteousness, and it refers to the sword of the Spirit and the helmet as the hope of salvation. We ultimately have our hope as our helmet. Just like faith is in our heart, we have a breastplate of righteousness and a shield of faith to guard our heart. We have a helmet that guards our mind, guards our thoughts, guards our thinking. And that's where we keep hope. That's where hope is. Hope is our mental outlook, our attitude. And that's how it's in our head, where faith is in our heart. It's another difference between faith and hope. But the reality is we're in a spiritual battle. We have to equip these things. We have to stand strong on these things. We have to use the word of God offensively, just like we use the armor defensively. That means when we read the word of God, we don't just read it. We read it with life. We read it with hope. We read it like it's being spoken to us, like it is right now. I just want to take a moment um, and read a passage that's been coming to me. I thought it was in Malachi. I kept looking all through Malachi and couldn't find it. It's in Habakkuk. Uh, let me just read a couple verses in Habakkuk. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says, The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry unto you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, preserve 
judgment, uh, perverse judgment proceeds. In verse 5, I love verse 5, Habakkuk 1.5 says, Look around the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. Basically, it says, I, got, I am God, I am doing something, I'm working something in the nations. If I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't even believe it, but I'm working. God is working right now today, and I can say I have faith that God is working because I put my faith in God's word, which is ultimately founded on truth, and I can have my hope in that, and I know that hope will be fulfilled because it's based on truth. And I can use that verse, I can read that scripture, I can proclaim that scripture and say it doesn't matter what's getting me down, it doesn't matter what's happening at work, it doesn't matter what's happening with my friends, I have hope in God's word and that will see me through. That hope isn't passive, that hope isn't wishful thinking, that hope is grounded on something bigger than me and I can proclaim that word hopeful with 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 authority, with boldness, with confidence, because I have faith in that same thing. Because I have ultimate confidence in who God is and what his word says. So we have to have our faith, fact, and feeling in order so we can accurately use our hope, so we can accurately do spiritual warfare, so we can do what we're called to do. So not only do we hope and hope for Hope we hope enough, but we hope for more than enough. Let's go back to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, again, is a great psalm we started with by, by the psalmist David. And I want to get to verse 5. It says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. What does that mean if your cup overflows? That means you have more than enough. Ever stop looking at what you're pouring into and more than enough comes out and it all goes to waste and it spills all over? That's how we as Christians should be. We're called to be more than enough, to have more than an abundance. But that more than enough, you can't contain yourself. Think back to the Israelites in the wilderness. God was providing for them. He'd provide quail and manna for them. They couldn't save up that blessing today and hold it for tomorrow. It would go to, it would go to waste. Yesterday's bread will not feed you. That's the lesson he was teaching the Israelites. He's saying the blessing, the food I'm putting on your table, the food in your belly today won't be enough to sustain you tomorrow. Therefore, I need you to come back tomorrow. And they had faith and hope that it would be there again tomorrow. They couldn't save it up. They couldn't do anything with that. And we have to do that in the same way. If we want to be strong spiritual warriors in this day, every single day we need to feed ourselves so that we are more than enough, so that we have more than enough inside of us, that we can get a little bit of the light of God's word inside of us so that it's shining on the outside of us. If we want to be a witness to people around us, we better be so full of God that we have a little bit extra to spill over to you. I'm a pretty happy person, and I can, I can bring joy to other people because I'm so happy. I have more than enough joy for me. I can't contain it. But I can give a little bit to you and you and you, and pretty soon I'm, I'm tapped out. Where do I get more? God's Word. Where do I get more strength? God's Word. Where do I get more a positive mental outlook or hope, true biblical hope? I read God's word. I put my faith in God's word. I understand what it says. I understand that those promises are true. I know that God will come through and do what he said he will do. That's what true hope is. That's what it's for. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just, oh, you know, that's just what you want. That's selfishness. That's pride. It's not that. I'm saying God is on the throne. I know who he is. And it might not be the way I think. It might not be the way I picture it. It might not be how it is. But I know God's in control. I know that there are better days ahead. I know that he'll always take care of his own. Uh, look at Romans 8.28. That's one of the most hopeful scriptures there is. All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. But there's some, there's some, recommend, there's some prerequisites on that. Do all things work together for good all the time? No, they don't. But they do for people who believe in God's word, who are called according to his purpose, who are living right, who are doing what they're supposed to do, who've used this hope to gain some perseverance, who've been through some pretty hellacious times and come through it better people on the other end and have some good godly character that's been proven through the fire and able to stand the next time it comes worse. And it's coming worse, and it'll come worse. But that's part of it, because through that, through that trial, through that tribulation, through that refining process, our hope can be made perfect. Our hope can bring about perseverance. Our hope can bring about godly character. 
Can you still hope if this happened? Can you still hope if you lost a loved one? Can you still hope in who God is if this happened, if this happened, if this happened? Some of those, some of those what ifs are pretty, pretty difficult. Some of those things would shake your faith. Are, are you going to be shaken? Do you have your hope grounded in something bigger than just circumstances? When everything give, is going good, it's easy to hope. But how about when things are going bad? Do you truly have the hope in God's word that his promises will endure? He'll always see his righteous. They'll never be forsaken. They'll never be found begging for bed. God will always take care of his righteous. doesn't matter what happens. I have that hope. I have that optimism. I have that faith. It doesn't matter what's going to happen because it's founded in something bigger than myself. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just personality. It's not just smiles on my face that I'm forcing through bared teeth. It is true hope that's based on God's scripture. We need to have enough of that so that we can make a difference in who we're around. I did the catechism, catechism for Christian kids this morning, KKC, with uh, uh, high schoolers and junior hires, and we talked about being salt and light, and that goes right along with it. How can we be salt and light in this earth if we don't have hope, if we don't have a light shining within us? Like what Brian said, the dark gets darkest just before the dawn. When things do get darker, light shines a lot brighter. We need a brighter light within us. We need a little more hope within us. We need a little more joy within us. We need a little more fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. We need more Holy Spirit, amen? We need a Holy Spirit in the church. We need a move of the Holy Spirit in this day and age. We need a revitalization of the church if we want to be brighter than the darkness that's coming for us. And we better be bright enough and have enough to spill that over to the people around us. If we don't even have enough hope for ourselves, how can we hope to save someone else? How can we hope to have anything left over for, you know, our friend, our neighbor, our, the person you run into the, at the grocery store that's hopeless? You better have enough hope in you that you have enough to give to them. And that hope isn't founded on you. And that source that you get hope from is endless. It's eternal. It's limitless. Because it's coming from God, because it's coming from God's word, we need to have a hope in something bigger than ourselves, better than ourselves. And that's not wishful thinking. That is based on the truths of God's word. That's based on fact, not feeling. That's based on fact, the fact and truths of God's word. David, the psalmist, understood this years before the Holy Spirit was ever given at Pentecost. He understood how to tap through, how to break through to that next layer. He said, my cup runs over. I am so full of the Holy Spirit that I have more than enough. I just give it off in praise. I give it off in worship. I give it off to the people around me because I can't contain the blessing of God. I can't help but share it with the people around me. David understood that in the Old Testament. and He's surpassing the time and age that he was in because he was so full of God, had such a perfect heart for God that he... He under, had an understanding and a revelation of who God is better than what the people at his time and day and age had. He knew who God was. He knew who God called him to be. He knew what his life was all about. He's supposed to be full to overflowing. And that's what we need to be as Christians. We need to have enough of God in us, enough hope in us, enough joy in us, that we have enough to share with that person next to us so we can be the witness, the light, the salt, the people that bring up people around us, people that make a difference in the lives around us. That's what we're called to be as people of hope that have more than enough. So do we want to be half empty, glass half empty, or glass half full Christians? I don't want to be either. I want to be someone that has my cup full to overflowing, spilling out so I can fill that glass next to me overflowing, so I can fill that glass next to that person overflowing, so they can fill the glasses around them, because I want to have enough hope and enough God inside me bubbling over that I can't contain, that I can't help but make a difference in my community, in my church, in my town, at my workplace, that people will be different, act different, be blessed just because I'm there. If, if, uh, if Sodom and Gomorrah can be saved for ten righteous, God, this nation can be saved with just the people in this church, let alone the people in this nation and every church around us that has been praying and fasting and on our knees. When we pray, it means something. When we do battle in the Spirit, it means something. It's more than a hope. It's more than wishful thinking. It's more than making me feel better because I prayed. We take ground and move ground in the Spirit. We're going to pull the kingdom of God onto this earth and make His will be done here, not the will of the enemy, not the will of some person, not the will of some dictator, not the will of some evil empire. We are going to enact God's will on this earth, God's will for our nation, God's will for our country, because that's who we believe in, and that's what we're called to do, and that's what we're praying for, and that's what we have hope in. Because we have our hope founded on something more than ourselves. I want to leave you with a, a passage in Romans chapter 8. If I can find it. 
Uh, it's not eight. Romans fifteen thirteen. Romans eight fifteen thirteen. Romans eight. No, stop saying eight. <laughs> Romans fifteen thirteen. Not Romans eight. It says now. Everybody say now. Now, now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to abound in hope this morning? Do you want to have your cup overflowing this morning? Get into God's Word. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. There's enough Holy Spirit in this room to overflow every single one of your cups. I believe it. Amen? Amen. We need a little more Holy Spirit. We need to abound in the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have that in your life and you want that prayer, turn this into a prayer and say, I'm going to pray Romans 15, 13. Now may God of the hope fill me with joy and peace in believing that I may have abundant hope, that I may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to abound in hope. I want to abound in joy. I don't want to just get by. I want to abound. I want to be overflowing. I want to be next level. I don't want to just get through, just survive, just meagerly make it through. I just got to, you know, one more day. I just got to make it through the day. That's not how I want to live, and that's not a good Christian witness. I get I, we're all down at times. That's going to happen. That's life. That's tribulation. That's trials. But don't stay down. Don't give up hope. Without hope, there's... Compare people with hope and without hope. Compare hope and hopelessness, despair and depression and anxiety with hope, joy, and a future. It's so much greater. If you want life, there's hope where there's life. There's strength where there's hope. And we need to have hope. We need to have strength. We need to have peace. We need to have serenity. We need to have endurance and perseverance and tenacity to endure the things that are coming. And that comes from a hope in a God bigger than ourselves. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are in control. You are on the throne. You are bigger than we even know, Lord. You're eternal from the very creation, Lord. You've set this earth into motion. You've placed each one of us here this morning. You've um, put us on this earth with plans and purpose, each and every one of us, Lord. You've given us your word in abundance. We have access to your word like never before. We can read it for ourselves, Lord. Give us a hunger and a tenacity for your scripture, for your word. Let it just bring revelation to our eyes and understanding to our ears, Lord. Help our minds to be on fire for you. Help us to think the thoughts that you'd have us to think and renounce the thoughts that are just hopeless, depressing, and deadly, Lord, that just don't bring any life to situations, Lord. Fill us with hope. Fill us to overflowing. Fill us with joy. Fill us with peace. Fill us with strength, Lord God. Give us a tenacity and a strength to endure the things that we'll have to endure, Lord. We just pray for strength. But we believe as the dark gets darker, the light within us will get brighter, that we can shine brighter to make a difference in this life, that we'll bring in the next uh, revelation, the next revival in this United States, in this church, Lord God. We speak life. We speak revival into this church, into this land, Lord. We say it's not over. We have hope for better days. We have hope for a future. We have hope for life. God is on the throne, and we put our hope and our trust in you, Lord God, that you are doing something. We don't see it, but if we saw it, we couldn't even believe it because it's so magnificent. It's so big. It's so great. It's so mighty that you are on the throne, and you're working that, and we put our hope in that. We put our hope and trust. We put our hope in the precious word of God. In the Lord's name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Have hope this morning. Amen.